Yes, it has survived Dramati said. Um, I haven't ever met Bante face to face before. But in a way, I feel such a deep connection to him. It's almost like I don't really need to meet him. I mean, I do long to meet him, but it's almost like I don't really need to meet him. Maybe it would be okay if, if we never meet in the conventional way. So I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background. So I came along to the LBC six years ago when I was 25. And I was reflecting on it as, write, as I was writing the talk. And in a way, as soon as I walked through the doors of the LBC, I kind of stepped into a relationship with Bante. Um, at the time, I was quite disillusioned with my life. And through discovering Buddhism, um, my world really began to open up. It was like, well, it was like the world came in. And I guess at that time when I first came along, Bante was very much in the background. And it wasn't until I asked to become a Mitra that I started to kind of turn towards Bante and I started to question my connection with him. And in a way, I didn't really feel like I had a, I didn't feel like I had a connection with him. I didn't really know him. Um, I also felt like the photos that I'd seen of him, I thought he looked a bit creepy. <laughs> um, I think I was comparing him unfavorably to those like beautiful Tibetan faces, those monks that have got those soft, open faces and they look really kind of spiritual. <laughs> and I listened to some of his talks and I thought they were a bit dry, a bit boring. He talked really slowly and I, I thought, oh, this isn't really relevant to my life. Um, yeah, so in asking to be a Mitch, I suddenly did question, am I in the right tradition? Um, but I was really taken by the Dharma that was communicated through his disciples and by the Sangha. Um, and very early on in my meditation experience, I had really strong imaginative connections to the Buddha as well. So, yeah, but I didn't feel this kind of like heart connection to like to a guru. Um, so I just sat down and I, I was actually... I think I was meeting you, Subhadramati. We were meeting the week before my ceremony to talk. Anyway, so I sat down and I just reflected um, consciously on, on Bante. And um, I just thought about what he's done. And like he's not a kind of cuddly, warm guru. Oh, he didn't seem like that to me. But he had given his life completely to the Dharma. Um, and that dharma had touched me so quickly in so many different ways and so many other... I could see how it had a positive effect on other people as well. Um, yeah, and also I just... I really respected the order members that were around the LBC at the time and he was their teacher. So it just seemed uh, like... I couldn't really separate out, basically, um, them from him. Yeah, and it's quite funny in a way to, to say, to talk about, you know, finding his image a bit creepy or finding his talks boring because now I feel like um, I really love listening to him and I really appreciate he's got such a dry sense of humour and I really love how he describes himself as like the thorn rather than the flower of the rose. And um, yeah, so I guess it wasn't, yeah, what have I written? It's, it wasn't love at first sight with Bante. <laughs> but I realised through that reflection that, you know, he couldn't be separated out from, from the Buddhist centre, basically, and the people here. The, yeah, and then, in, and then I started to get more involved after, after becoming a Mitra. Um, I started to study him more intensively, I suppose. I asked for ordination. And so then I had a more conscious, kind of more imaginative relationship with him. And I started going to Tiratnaloka, so the women's retreat centre, when you ask for ordination, go to Tiratnaloka. And there we studied him really in depth and also not just on an intellectual level, really kind of breathing life in, into his teachings. And, um, and it was there really that I started to have this more imaginative connection with Bante. We did, we studied um, the survey of Buddhism and it's just, I was just blown away really by the kind of breadth and depth of his Dharma knowledge. And we did a ritual film, and I, I just really felt his presence on, on the retreat, basically. Also, at, um, 
at Tiwanaloka, I met Vajra Tara, who, who lives there, and she um, has got a very close relationship with Bante. And I um, made a good connection with her, and I really, really respected her. And in a way, through her close relationship with him, um, my relationship with him started to develop. I started to get more of a sense of him, kind of more of a, a personal sense of him through her relationship with him. Yeah, and that relationship to him through his disciples kind of continued as I started to get more involved. So I moved into the community, I started working at the Buddhist Centre, and I started to get to know um, order members, uh, well, more personally. Um, so people who have like a close relationship with Bante or a devotional relationship with Bante, particularly um, with um, Dharma Dinner, um, who was around kind of right from the start, knows Bante very well, with Maitra Bandhu and with Sabhadra Mati. So, uh, what was I gonna say? Yeah, so the kind of, the, the closer I got to them, the deeper my relationship was with him in a way because they had such a strong connection to him. And I tried to glean as, as much information from them as possible, particularly from Dharma Dinner. I, I love it when she's always, she's telling me stories about what it was like, um, kind of in the early days, her relationship to Bante. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Yeah, so... Yes, yeah, so I think it's that connection to them, to these order members that I'm befriending, particularly with the women that I live with. I see them in, in lots of different contexts, lots of different situations, and I really see them working with their own minds, um, practicing kindness and their devotion to Bante and how they've also committed their lives to serving the Dharma and that he's their teacher. So that just deepens my confidence in him. So as long as, as, along with my own reflections and my own study, then those friendships as well give me more confidence in Bante. Yeah, and then most recently, um, uh, Bante became ill. I think as most of you probably know, he was ill over, over Christmas. And I was on the team for another one of these big winter retreats. And um, he had pneumonia and... Um, we placed this really beautiful picture of him on the shrine and um, we, on the retreat, which we wouldn't normally do, we talked about him, well Maitre Bandi talked about him a lot and talked to the retreatants about him, most days actually, and in the, my meta practice I was just bringing him to mind and the retreat was at Adistana where he lives, so the sense of him is quite strong there already. And every, um, yeah, every time I was in the shrine and after meditation, I just go up to the shrine and I just place my head on the ground in front of his picture and kind of just in gratitude and also wishing him well. Um, and it was at that time that I felt, well, I felt really devoted. I felt really devoted to Bante and I also felt really appreciative of what he'd created. I don't know, probably quite a few of you have been on those big winter retreats and they're really, really incredible because you see such a transformation of people when they first arrive to when they leave either five days or 10 days. And um, that sense of that collective practice all together. So they're quite strong retreats already. And with Bante being ill, it felt like it had more of a potency and on that retreat, um, the Dharma just really, really opened up for me. I think something about placing my head on the ground in front of his picture, um, just that small act actually of devotion and receptivity, the Dharma just opened up in a way that I hadn't done before. So I was hearing quite simple teachings that I'd heard, like it feels like loads and loads of times before, but suddenly I felt like I really heard them, I really understood them. So it's like, yeah, the Dharma came alive like a kind of living, breathing force. Um, yeah, and Sabhadra Mati um, talks about how, um, well, when she last met Bante, he said that her presence was a gift. She didn't, hadn't brought a gift to bring him, and he said her presence was the gift. And um, that notion that the disciple is the gift to the teacher I think it's a really beautiful image and um, in a way 
so your so Badramati's devotion to Bhante is a gift to me, and then my devotion to Bhante and to Badramati is a gift to both of them. And um, in a way, the way to be devotional isn't even to to well to practice friendship, to build community, to study the Dharma. In all those ways, it's practicing devotion, which are gifts to Bhante, the gifts to Subhadramati, and also gifts to the world. Um, yeah, so I, I want to live in a in a world of um, where there's appreciation and where there's a culture of um, respect and reverence, and. It's just so clear to me that without Bante, none of this would be possible. And in a way, this is like, well, it feels like this is the most meaningful thing and one of the, yeah, the most beautiful things in my life. So it feels so natural that I'd be devotional to Bante and, and also that devotion um, is, so enjoy is so enjoyable. Like, um, it feels like it's the whole path, really, the path of appreciation. And it starts with him and then that lineage all the way back to the Buddha. Yeah, so I'm going to finish. And I just wanted to finish with um, some words from the man himself. So I'm just going to read this out. So he's talking about reverence. So it includes such emotions as admiration, wonder and delight in the fact that there exists or existed others superior to oneself in creative ability or spiritual attainment. It is akin to such terms as vandana or salutation and puja or worship, all of which acts, all of which acts are expressive of positive emotion. To live without looking up to anyone represents an impoverishment of one's emotional life and indeed an impairment of one's very humanity. <laughs>